Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Harder Not Smarter podcast today. We have a phenomenal guest, Mark Holden, who has a huge variety in his background. He's been pretty much been the uh, the jack of all trades since he uh, since he was a teenager. I mean, he, this guy has been a uh, a pilot. He got into the the military right after nine eleven. He joined some three letter agencies. Um, he hit the time and just right that he was involved with a lot of the UAS projects going on. Um, and now he's the founder of Holden, which is a professional services for um, content marketing strategy w- within the defense industry. He's also an avid supporter of mindfulness through meditation. Um, and he's just an incredibly interesting person. We're really excited to have him on the show today. So Mark, welcome. Great to be here, Kevin, Greg, just an absolute honor. Good to, good to finally be here. Thanks for the warm introduction. And it's uh, just, a, just a pleasure to be here with you too. I'm looking forward to this one. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I guess what the, the, the highlights of what's going on today is is all the, the drone warfare, the UAS stuff. I know you've been involved with it pretty much since the beginning. So we might as well jump into the, the fun topic of What's going on with the world in UAVs, UAS, drones, attacks, um, and all the fun stuff that's, that's going on out there? Yeah, let's talk about it because it is an important part of the battlefield zeitgeist, which we find ourselves today. And let me be abundantly clear, uncrewed or unmanned warfare like stems back from the 1800s, right? We're just seeing a massive technological evolution of it. For me to say, you know, I was there during the old days of drones means I was there for the advent of quadcopters, right? But early days of <laughs> good G-Wow, old DJI, we were, yeah, exactly. Early <laughs> days of GW, we were still slinging ravens and pumas and using them in operations, and, and didn't really do much for them for twenty years or so until it's right about 2013, 2014, We started noticing these three hundred dollar quadcopters coming off the shelves of like Best Buy, getting armed with cameras and cheap little, you know, dollar and a half servos. And then getting used to, um, you know, spot for sniper positions or used to um, uh, exploit, you know, operations that are currently ongoing. They're used for very cheap reconnaissance tools. They're used for very cheap, um, you know, uh, explosive and lethality device delivery. Like it's it's out there. And, you know, it's really interesting because we've had this this kind of amalgamation of this blend of commercial and defense really driving this toy quadcopter evolution pretty strongly. At this, At one hand, you saw... The advent of these things on the battlefield right alongside them getting very very well adopted into hollywood I mean, there's a time where just hollywood just used helicopters all the time now they just use drones mm-hmm. all the time because it's a heck of a lot cheaper and a lot easier you also get a pretty good quality piece of picture there oh well, it's amazing so it's, they can get right up in there oh yeah it's crazy and so today right you had the civilian market driving you know innovation and adoption and things like this things getting sold into best buy for people that are trying to you know take pictures of them while they're going dirt biking or mountain biking or doing extreme stuff like the 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 next kind of evolution of the gopro but what we started to see on the battlefield was those things getting absolutely leveraged for uh, a very relatively inexpensive lethality delivery device today you know we've got three three pretty heavy fronts we're keeping an eye on right today right here we are q1 of 2024 we've got this protracted unified land operation in the European continent. This is stuff we trained for in like the eighties, but here we are training and getting after it again. And we're seeing both sides of the fight, the the Russians, the Ukrainians leveraging these small, cheap, relatively inexpensive quadcopters for, for their combat operations, where they're using like first person view racing drones to take out tanks. Like this is asymmetric warfare at its finest. This is a $500 problem or $500 solution to a $500,000 or $5 million or $50 million problem. We're seeing the advent of unmanned surface vehicles or uncrewed surface vehicles, unmanned or uncrewed ground vehicles, right? We're seeing cross domain use of uncrewed vehicles in this, in this fight. The second, Mm -hmm. you know, front we're looking at right now is this new world order in the middle East where we're seeing relatively state sponsored uh, groups, you know, leverage high orders of technology in their uncrewed or unmanned systems to conduct relatively rudimentary attacks against U.S. forces based in the region. We just lost our first, um, you know, service member to an air attack for the first time in way too long. Um, and, so, and so, are these are these attacks coming from the Houthis? Is that more similar to was like the the V one or the V two that Germany was launching yeah, at, bingo, at England? Pretty much just like dumb launch up there and maybe maybe do some tracking at the very end. Yeah, and they're they're a little bit more um, they're a little bit more capable than like the old V two rockets were. Now they still use relative inertial measurement units, but today with global navigation satellite systems and 
a uh, much, much higher quality inertial measurement units, mainly driven by the advent of cell phone technology and little IMUs inside of your cell phones to, to make sure it's good. We're able to get size, weight, power, cost of those devices down pretty cheap. And so the, the, like the, the systems that the Houthis are using now are highly capable systems. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we think about that. Heck, you know, they've, they've been using them for quite some time. And, and for them, they're like, you know, they're area weapons, right? They don't expect it to be precision guided systems and things like that. Now, the last, last um, so the second theater, this new world order in the Middle East, right? We saw the, the Israeli conflict getting, you know, used on both sides with some, some small semblance of unmanned systems or uncrewed systems, but the real showstopper are these larger, more systems of consequence that the Houthis are, are chucking over to the, um, you know, the ships that are hanging out in the Red Sea and things like that. But the third mm -hmm. um, kind of area of conflict is really was driving uh, some of the, uh, the the dynamics within unmanned systems or uncrewed systems, primarily those small quadcopters. And that's the advent of hybrid warfare waged by the People's Republic of China. We see this in the form of TikTok and the various manipulation of our youth to intend to retard our youth in their time, right? We saw the economic program. Can you say retard? Uh, Retard. I can say retard. <laughs> say retard. I'm not. It. I'm not yeah. saying that someone is. I'm saying that <laughs> you retard. Much like I would retard an airdropped munition to ensure that the timing's right and things like that. I'm here to slow it down. So yes, <laughs> make no mistake about the uh, the Chinese Communist Party and by dance leverages TikTok. We're trying to That's slow our our youth down. Slow the youth down exactly. Um, <laughs> Through, through these these silly challenges and things like that. But at the same time, what we're seeing in the, the drone industry as a second and third order effect of this is the, the People's Republic of China, primarily the Chinese Communist Party, subsidizes the DJI product line. These these thousand dollar aircraft that you're buying off the shelves cost thousands of dollars to make, but the that individual organization subsidizes that the price of these things, one to tank the economics of the unmanned systems industry in the United States, right? When we were trying to sling American made quadcopters at a hundred grand when our enemy is trying to sling them at a thousand bucks. Of course they adopt the enemy at first. And what happened was they realized that each one of these little things, these little quadcopters or little sensors that were just bringing information back, back and back and back. And that's why today, Q1 of 2024, you're hearing a lot of discussion on legislation of just the complete ban of all Chinese origin drones in the United States. Um, is that for the military or is that like period, uh, consumer? Period. Period. Military is okay. done, right? Military is with the advent of the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 848, a couple of years ago. Military is done, not using any People's Republic of China stuff. The challenge so this now is, is that. Is, is this that, similar to like the, the Huawei? uh yep, 5g router stuff that was going on they're yep. just sending information back you got it you got it okay. right Drifting back same thing with Lenovo it. too Lenovo yep. just got popped as well um for being part of the ccp bam and there's a there's a few other investigations going on right now of other companies um that we don't necessarily you know subscribe to to the fact that they're they're in bed with the ccp but they are and they're under investigation 2024 we're going to see a lot of this and this is hybrid warfare at its finest we are generally find like we generally find ourselves as humanity at war right we're generally in some form of conflict um what we're seeing you know right now with some of this economic programming and some of the hybrid warfare we're seeing with with tiktok and all the other you know second and third order effects as a result of it uh, is a deliberate escalation of this nature of hybrid warfare we find ourselves in this gray zone we are currently relatively at peace but our job is to prolong that peace continuum as long as humanly possible. The enemy's job is to shorten it. And right now, in you know, again, early 2024, we are absolutely in the throes of that struggle right now. So it's an interesting time. And, and because of all the ad, all the, the conflict in the world and all the economic programming, it's a really interesting time to be in unmanned systems manufacturing. We're going to start to see you know, a, a big push on not just a, a affordable mass like we've been talking about, but available mass, right? Um, it's gonna be so important going forward in the in the the theaters of conflict that we're gonna find ourselves in. So it's a very poignant topic. That's kind of where we're seeing uh, unmanned systems use right now in the various theaters of combat. However, there's so many good stories of of unmanned systems or uncrewed systems doing awesome things. There's also terrible stories of the, those things running drugs and things like that. So there's no shortage. Yeah, Over. I hate to be morbid, but like as I'm <laughs> thinking about this, and I, I'm interested to get your thoughts on this. Like yeah. to me, if there's a large scale attack on attack on the United States, it's going to be with an unmanned system. Like that's, that's what's, what's coming next would, would be my thought at least just how accessible it is and how easy it is to operationalize. I'm surprised we haven't seen it yet. Right. Like 
these like you can get aerosol sprayers, right? Five kilograms of pesticides to go make sure your vineyards are properly, you know, taken care of and your 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 fruits can grow. But like I, the same thing, I can just like fly over a stadium with a bunch of you know like like some analog of sarin over it and and do a do a terrible thing to tens of thousands of people. I'm beyond shocked that we haven't seen a large scale saturation attack. And I say saturation attack deliberately, not necessarily swarm attack. I think swarms the big concern everybody's worried about artificial intelligence isn't just there just yet to really feel that stuff but a saturation attack meaning one operator many aircraft all just there to kind of saturate our defenses um is just too easy <laughs> it's just so swarm easy. is swarm be considered ai driven you like put a target on the map and say go attack this and let it go run free where uh saturation is one person or at least like like a, a central command post controlling a bunch of things, sending it forward, trying to <clears throat> overwhelm the the defenses of an area. Yeah, and, and you can think about it like um, you know, one person, many ten people can control ten different drones and saturate an area, much like we would saturate an area for you know coverage of fires and things like that. The um, the one person can do that same thing, putting ten aircraft into a general area to confuse and suppress an enemy. However, when I flip the swarm switch in my head, there's like a whole bunch of backend behavior like task auctioning and routing and rerouting and a whole bunch of different, um, you know, artificial intelligence like behavior to ensure that those particular unmanned or uncrewed systems are operating in concert with one of one, one another. Um, when they start acting intelligently, like some of the work we were doing over at Shield AI, like that's that's swarm behavior. Would I, when I, one person just throwing a bunch of quadcopters into the stadium, likely uh, saturation behavior. But yeah, gotcha. And, and you mentioned Shield AI. I know their main thing that, at least from the outside, not ever having actually worked there, that I've seen is they're looking to, you know, they they outfitted and I think it was an F sixteen or an F fifteen um, with some AI type stuff to see if they can get some. Uh, um, wingman type stuff going on. Where do you see the the future of, of that going on? Because I know, you know, the U.S. loves having these big capital pieces of equipment, millions and millions of dollars for each of them. You know, you picture the movie Stealth with uh, actually who was in that movie? Jessica. I think Beagle, Jamie Fox was in that. Jamie Fox. Yeah, I forget. The <laughs> yeah, Jamie Fox <laughs> ran into the mountain. Um, but yeah, like we, we have that. You know, hundred million dollar, two hundred million dollar uh, wingman versus you know having a a central plane out there with hundreds or thousands of little DJI wannabe type things popping out of it and and going forward where they kind of sit back. What, what do you see the most likely and then the, you know, your opinion of what would be the, the best approach for us going forward? Yeah, my career thus far has been made off the backs of warfare and defense and aerospace, but I'll be the first to line up to say like my future desired end state of all this is a bunch of robots fighting robots and just people sitting back Anders game style, just watching mm -hmm. the robot mayhem. But there's a couple of steps we've got to hit to get there, right? The next big step is the teaming of human and uncrewed machines, right? It's human machine teaming, right? And you're starting to see this through that wingman concept. What we were doing in the initial days of of taking dogfighting behavior and loading it into F-16 with Shield AI was just that. It was a you know, rudimentary, like, how can we have two aircraft play hide and seek and tag at the same time, you know, and, and uh, what can the air, like, what can the aircraft learn? What can you teach it? What can you teach the, the you know, the hive mind software that we're doing? It was just incredibly novel. Um, but you mentioned it like it's teaming up first first and foremost the initial dogfighting behavior was like a driver assist essentially from mm -hmm. in f 16 it was like you know if you've ever driven a car with driver assist a little bit of input a little bit of direction to help you kind of get get the envelope correct on on how to eliminate your enemy that's kind of the nature of the beast there without getting too direct into it now where you're starting to see in the future is like yes one crude fighter jet operator um working in tandem with potentially a prescription of potentially 5x uncrewed systems supporting them this is like f-35 in front of a diamond formation with like five or six uh you know whatever ucavs unmanned or uncrewed combat air vehicles behind us those combat air vehicles could do a whole bunch of stuff they could bomb targets they could laze targets they can conduct battlefield damage assessment they can refuel me when i'm flying like there's a whole bunch of cool stuff we're seeing and we're seeing that in the air force right the the army right 
Greg, like what we started to see in the army was air launched effects, right? Future vertical lift program is done. Uh, <laughs> our, our future of recon reconnaissance, like vertical lift is still up to be determined for the army. But what we do know is that they will be com com uh, complemented with air launched effects. And these air launched effects seek to occupy the M299 Hellfire rail that exists on majority of combat attack aircraft, uh, low altitude, especially vertical lift aircraft today. So how can I take that Hellfire provisioned rail and put an uncrewed or an unmanned system onto it? And that's what air launched effects is all about. How can I, as a as a potentially a penetration force, conducting either a you know suppression of enemy air defense or whether I'm doing like a direct action penetration, like how can I as a as a as a small helicopter fighting force like launch out a whole bunch of effectors ahead of me, you know, cresting that ridge top to be able to jam battlefield communications, to be able to put sensors in the valley that I'm planning to attack to be able to put, you know, devices there to, to designate or destroy as needed. Um, and then eventually, like I said, the, the, this whole space will matriculate into a bunch of robots fighting robots and a GPS and comms and that environment. And we just get to sit in the sidelines like Ender's game and kind of watch the whole thing happen. That's kind of what we're heading towards over. That's, that's an impressive, uh, observation and, and prediction of what warfare is going to look like. It's, it's going to be super interesting. Well, I mean, is, what's going to be weird is when we we continue fighting against you know, proxy wars against people like the Houthis, and we're now sending in robots, what the international community is going to be saying, if it, it you know, is this an unfair fight now uh, that's, that's immoral because we're not sending any of our humans to go, to go die in battle, but we're killing all these other people. You know, at, at what point do you draw the line? with the Geneva Convention, which was written after, I believe, World War One, yep. um, to to conduct how countries fight each other. But like at what point are we gonna have to revise all that? Because we're like, hey, we're just not we're not sending people anymore. We're just sending a bunch of robots that are controlled by people that are far away from from any harm. Um, you know, what, what's gonna be the public outcry with with this stuff? You're already seeing a little bit with these drone strikes. Yep. Which is a terrible term anyway. They're not really drones. They're manned in vegas oh for sure yeah there's somebody <laughs> on the trigger on the back it's not some some uncrewed system deciding like now is a good place to release my payload yeah and yeah. i guess i man i may read my words in the future but I, I just think that's where we're heading as a fighting force and in the same argument could be made like if we do start sending uncrewed or unmanned systems out forward well our systems are are more precise right the, the collateral damage reductions measurable mm -hmm. the reduction in civilian casualties measurable right you look at the last like couple of wars everything from iraq to israel there is a 10x civilian casualty loss for every every one combatant. Every insurgent that we kill, we kill 10 civilians, or we or whoever the coalition force is fighting that. Like that's generally how it's how it worked in Iraq. It's how it worked, that's how it's working right now in Israel. And the argument may come up like, hey, we're using smaller, less lethal, less collateral damage munitions that are more precise. That don't hurt as many people that kill a lot faster, right? We started to see this with the um, uh, the flying Ginsu or the ninja bomb, right? The the um, the the non kinetic or the non explosively kinetic Hellfire variant. The, the Hellfire oh, I have heard of that one. Yeah, it's just like a, a tungsten rod, basically yeah. that just hits really hard. Essentially, yeah. It's uh, so it, it you know Hellfire standard, um, standard mm -hmm. Hellfire comes off the rails, uh, hits its you know on its way to its target, going terminal. The um, these like uh, these like wings come out of it almost like an X essentially. And then it just plows right into its target, you know, relative to the circular probability of the laser that's targeting it in. But uh, essentially like you can, you can, you can do damage to somebody in like the passenger seat of a Honda civic um, theoretically leaving the occupants. Okay. Uh, we, uh, well, we haven't seen that done in practice, but essentially like <laughs> we're still able to just reduce that tar, that car without a whole lot of explosive you know, support and stuff like that. And so the, the reduction of organic tissue damage, we're starting to see a little bit of it, but we're still at that 10 X number. We're still killing 10 times as many civilians as we are in the combatants on the battlefield. So we got a way to go. So how, how does someone like, if they could jump on your, your LinkedIn, they see Navy corpsman. How does, how does a Navy corpsman go from, being Navy Coleman to understanding all this, all this detailed information about UAS, about warfare, about intelligence gathering. Like, what, what is your story that, that got you here? Yeah, I appreciate that, man. I'll, I'll take a minute and get us all ramped up. So I am a product of just being at the right place at the right time. I'm not a special human. I don't have any special knowledge. I just have a drive. 
um, an intellectual curiosity and the opportunity to be at the right place at the right time where great mentors have just put me into the tough situations that have allowed me to thrive as a human. So you jump on my LinkedIn, you'll see just a shit ton of aviation content. And most of these people are like, how, like, why is the Navy corpsman talking about SR-71 Blackbirds? And why, like, why are people care? B-52. About it? B-52, right? So like, why do people care? So I, I come from a long line of aviators. My grandfather was a bomber pilot in World War II, did the POW thing over the Japanese theater. My grandparents on my mother's side were absolutely deeply affected by World War II. My dad owned a small corporate airline. And so by the time I was a kid, six years old, running radios and radars for my dad's planes, learning how to learn how to do that. But last time I was 12, I was logging pilot and command time. And by the time I wanted to go test for the driver's license exam for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I was already licensed and certified to fly large, complex, multi-engine commercial airplanes. And so for me, I'm going to be a fighter pilot, right? Like that was my jam. <laughs> um, but when it came time to figure out which four-year institution I was going to hang my hat in to get myself into a military cockpit, GWAT kicked off. And there was no way in hell I was going to stick my head into a four-year institution because as far as I knew, the war was going to be over. So I walked into a recruiter's office. You know, the army was really depressing for me because everybody just seemed miserable and they wore a bunch of gray uniforms and it just didn't seem like for me. The Marine Corps recruiter, I poked my head in. They seemed pretty hardcore, but they were really busy. Um, I didn't make it down the hallway to the Air Force recruiter. I just popped into the Navy, um, you know, I, and because I, you know, whatever, thought about didn't really think as much about which branch I was joining as much as I probably should have. Um, but, you know, when I, in a, I had the opportunity to talk to a Navy recruiter, um, you know, I, I, my biggest call was just like helping people that were dying overseas. I think that was it. Just seeing all the death tolls in the early days of GWAC coming through was a lot. And I just wanted to help. And so this Navy corpsman thing, like I get to spend a little bit of time on ships, but I still get to go do, you know, ground stuff with Marines. Like this sounds awesome. And, so I had the opportunity to go do that. And again, man, it was just right place, right time, right place, right ops, right place, right training, right place, right mission, right place, right outcome. And that's just kind of how it grew in. And my life is a series of just me not being patient enough to wait to the next screen. And so I you know, got out of the Navy because the Navy wanted me to go work in you know, a, 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 sh um, a clinic right, or a schoolhouse for a couple of years before I could get back after it. And I had- Damn you know, short tours. Yeah, damn short tours, right? And so I, I had, by the time I had clocked, you know, a couple of deployments, a couple of Afghanistan, some Horn of Africa work doing counter piracy operations, like I was ready for more. And so I, I had a very stern conversation with the Navy. They wouldn't let me get back over to Afghanistan. Um, and so I found the government organization that would and spent the next bunch of years just just supporting the counterterrorism mission set like a lot of us were. And through that was exposed to the, you know, intelligence life cycle, the um, you know, how the, the, the effectors on personnel we were doing back in the day and, and just getting to spend a lot of time with some great teams. Um, you know, but then from there I transitioned after, you know, got promoted and got a nice fancy office I transitioned off to a more high speed operational unit that was looking for more of the technological exploitation of new technologies on the battlefield. And that's really where I got to dig back into the, the, um, the aircraft and unmanned system side, like that's where I got exposed to you know, a lot of the drone fights. That's where I got a lot exposed to some of the early days of that stuff. And for me, the aviation background that I had was essential to me being, you know, just tasked with just being the like subject matter expert on, on those on crew systems at the time. And then, you know, when I transitioned out of operational service and went to start working in small businesses and in, in defense and aerospace industries, you know, I, I had a lot of, uh, I just had a lot of books. That's all I had. I still didn't have a college degree. I just didn't have any business experience. I just had a bunch of books in theory that I've just put into practice. And again, was just so fortunate to have great leadership um, to help mentor me and train me and allow me to kind of, uh, to kind of help placate that intellectual curiosity that I have. So I try to bring a lot, like a lot of the work I do right now is, is less technical maybe than I used to, right? So the, the, for those who, who were following along at home, you know, about six, seven months ago, I left my full-time role in corporate America, started scaling my professional services company and stuff like that. And, and for me, you know, the last couple of years in corporate America were highly technical, uh, high, high orders of technology, high growth stuff. And, um, you know, today, again, it's very marketing and strategy and, and, and kind of money focused for me and some of the, the work that I do with some of the clients and things like that. But again, man, I, I'm a product of just being in the right place at the right time and having the right leadership to help again placate that intellectual curiosity over that's 
that's an incredible story of, as you said, you know, just being, being right there where, where you needed to be. Um, you know, I'm sure some of it is intuition and, and maybe subconscious foresight of, of, you know, this is the the right place for you and your personality and what you're driving to do. Um, uh, but then also having the, the mindset of, if I can't have it, what the, or if I can't have my way, then I'm just gonna go find another yep. place that'll let me get there. Um, I know a lot of people that'll just languish in a, in a company or a job or, or something like that, just because they, they were told no. And so they passively said, well, that's just the way it is. I mean, most people won't quit the military because they didn't get their way and then go find mm -hmm. another agency that, that lets them do the things that they want to do. That's, that's a pretty unique mindset, I guess you can say to, uh, to keep following your, your aspirations, man, life so short. It's like a blip, right? This life we've got. And if you're called to do something, I can't imagine, like it gives me just anxiety in this moment, thinking about that person who's stuck in that oppressive environment. One of the things, um, you know, that I protract throughout my whole life that I probably pulled in through my grandparents is, is just the liberation of oppressed individuals. Right. And Greg, I see a smile and let's free some oppressed man, but <laughs> really, it's like there's been so much oppression in the world. We saw it a lot in you know, Wahhabi-driven Taliban rule. We saw it a lot in you know, the places we operate overseas. But we see it so much right now in corporate America where there are individuals who are just being suppressed. And it's so hard to be a small voice in a large company these days. And you are right. Like corporate America is packed to the gills with those individuals who are just pacified. Like their, their dreams, their hope is gone. The salary is the pill that they have given to forget all of that. And they will never know what it's like to follow dreams, to follow passion, right? And for me, one of the big things when I was engaging through mindfulness and all this stuff was understanding that life is a labyrinth and not a maze. There are no wrong turns. It may feel like you're walking to the outside of the circle. Sometimes it may feel like you're lost, but in a labyrinth, there is only one path to the middle. There are no wrong turns. And that's kind of what I think about with life. But these people, man, they, they don't recognize the difference between a, a job and a vocation. And I think that's the big thing, mm -hmm. right? A job is something you're good at. People will pay you money for, but a vocation is something that you love and the world needs. And so all of us, right, Kevin, Greg, like we're grounded in our roots and service. Like we signed on the dotted line. We raised our hands to serve our fellow humans in whatever capacity that may be. And for us, like we're here to do a mission, right? We felt the call of mission, but there are so many people out there in the world who have never felt that call of mission. Who well, it's also just the, the aversion to, to risk. You know, people, are, they have this idea in their head that, oh, no, this is a big company. I have job security. I have stability. I have a good paycheck coming in. Man, Facebook and Google and, and Apple, they're all firing right now. Well, laying off. Um, and it's like their job security is this this illusion that we've created to make ourselves believe that that we're safe. When the reality, the only person that you can truly rely on, and you know, this is a bit pessimistic, but it is yourself. And that's why we're we're so bullish with entrepreneurship. And even if it, entrepreneurship isn't your main thing, like it's, it's a side hustle having that diversity of, of income is, is huge in any kind of instability within the market. You know, maybe, maybe W2 goes away for a little while, but Hey, you have this other thing you've been doing, whether it's coaching, consulting, you know, doing, doing plaque, uh, CNS design with, uh, with, uh, uh 3d printing and stuff like that. Like there's so many little things you can just do on the side that doesn't take a ton of capital or time or energy, but it, it'll give you that passion, that outlet. And that's true security is when you're like, all right, if this thing goes away, I still have this primed and ready on the side and I'm enjoying it. Um, and best case scenario, it takes off enough that it can replace your, your regular income. And now you, now you're truly free. And now you have a lot of, um, uh, movement. And I, and I know I see it with, with your stuff. You talk about heading off to, to your ranch that you have with, uh, uh, uh with the horses that get put there by uh blanket on Bureau of Land Management. Yeah, there you go. Bureau of Land Management. Bureau you know, land, you, yeah. you don't even you don't even have to deal with the horses, but you just get to see them and hang out with them and, and just take in the beauty and you're not be like, man, I need to ask for permission to to take time off work. Um I don't need to worry about what else is going on. Like you can work remotely, you can travel, um, you can you can really plan out your life and, and enjoy it for what it is. And that freedom is so important these days. I've come to enjoy it. Like I was a, I was a remote employee before COVID and COVID just really solidified that. 
And I've been like, a, I've been a hard employee. I, I am like, if I've got any supervisors or any leadership listening, like mea culpa, because I know I was a challenging employee. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with my supervisors in the military. And I, and I mean, if, if your Navy time is any indication, like, oh, I can't do that. I'm quitting. Yeah, it's exactly. Oh, <laughs> no, I, just a hard I, line. Man, my, my leading petty officers were, uh, my chiefs were so good to me because I was just that fire plug of energy, just trying to find opportunity. And they were just trying to give me enough. And that's yeah, tough, man. But it, it truly is the path. Um, you know, you, you just got like, you've got to execute sovereignty in your life. If you feel the drive for something, you've got to go get it. I think that's what my life has just been a series of gut feelings and me like going after that gut feeling. It's like, and, and you, you bring up great points about entrepreneurship, right? I think when I left, like when I left corporate America, I knew that I wasn't going to get another W2 job just because of the lack of stability, the lack of security, the lack of sanctity of my humanity, which is a completely other conversation to, mm -hmm. to be sticking to corporate America with, which can't do it anymore. It, you have like, I, I was so, um, it was a bit of adventure, but it very, it was very exciting for me to stand up a whole bunch of income streams. Right. So like everything from rental properties to, um, you know, communities to consulting work to you know uh, to influencer marketing like i'm just trying to find my goal now is just different different income streams different opportunities to scale them and there's nobody that tell me how much how big i can grow it or how, how how hard i can work on it how little or how much i need to do anything i am i always prefer to be paid by my results and not my methods and what i found in my in my last couple of years in corporate america was there was a big focus on just paying me by my methods and not my results they didn't care that i that i did the things that they asked it's about did i do that in the way that they wanted me to and mm -hmm. i don't fit in the boxes super well i'm just like that tired toddler trying to smash a square peg of a lifestyle <laughs> into a round hole of my my appreciation of that lifestyle that was, that was my kids today Mechanism. Yep, there you go. Exactly <laughs> oh man, it's about following that dream, right? Following that that's what's within that gut. And you need time, like you need to plan time into your life to like ask yourself those questions. I think those people that walk around rudderless, the people who walk around pacified in their jobs in corporate America, just like haven't had the intellectual crop curiosity, like sit down on the floor, cross their damn legs, close their eyes, shut their mind off, and ask themselves like what it is that they really want to do with their life. And, and like, are yeah. they okay with how their life and time and energy is being spent right now? I think people just haven't asked that question. And once they do through mindfulness, that, meditation and all that stuff, I think they can do that. That's why I love working with, with veterans because you're working with a bunch of people that have taken that leap of faith. They've said, fuck it. And they've like gone all in on military service, which is, which is a huge leap of faith. You know, you really do not know anything about what you're getting yourself into when you, when you decide to sign on the dotted line. And so I feel like veterans are more, are more willing to just do that, to throw themselves out there, to be too dumb to fail and keep going. So that, that's a great that's, way to put it. Too dumb to fail. Yeah, Too dumb to fail. That's, that's really what it like, is, you know, and, and putting themselves out there. That's what, that's why the veteran community is to me is like, so, so built for entrepreneurship. Yeah. Well, the, the numbers just back us up too. Like with, uh, um, franchises one in seven franchises owned by a veteran but veterans are what i've seen anywhere from one to five percent of the population i don't know which one it is but even if it's five percent on the high end five percent is a whole lot less than one in seven people in in the country so um in, in franchises alone we absolutely dominate the space and you know, it just makes sense you're taking a, a proven business model and executing like hell on on a checklist and you're setting it up and you know the, the real thing that, that falls into your lap is, is the leadership, the management, the um, uh, enforcing of, of processes. And then you're just letting letting the people go, which is what uh, the military is. Like give the intent, make sure that they have all the tools they need to succeed and then let them do their job. Uh, and then, you know, on the entrepreneurship through acquisition space, buying businesses, there, yeah. there's a huge percentage of, of veterans that, that get into that too. Because again, they get that extreme ownership. They take control of a business. They see what has been um, going well, but they also see what is not going well. And, and just like um, everything else in the military where they, they preach to you, leave something better than when you got it. Same way with, with buying a business. You, know, you see what it is, make it better, move on. Um, and so the, it just, it screams for, for veterans to come serve in, in, in entrepreneurship capacities and, and business ownership. And I think we just need to get more resources out there to not only teach veterans about 
uh, you know, about entrepreneurship, like what the options are, how to get funding, what, what the different varieties are. Like we, Greg and I, you, you and I preach it all the time about the three B's of business, build, borrow, and buy. Um, you know, you can, you can build the business from scratch. You can borrow it, uh, borrow the business model through a franchise, or you can buy a business. All three of my great options. It really depends on your personality, how much capital you have access to, uh, and, and how you're looking to live your life. You know, do you, do you want to start, start with something that's just an idea in your head or do you just want to make something better because you're super process oriented um, and so I think it will we'll have a, a huge uptick in veteran satisfaction in life as more of them get away from being told oh just go get a job at Amazon or UPS or, or some other big organization where you're just collecting a paycheck buying buying time on, on the back end so you can you know have a retirement which whoever knows what, what retirement is anymore you know, the, the idea of sitting on a beach drinking Mai Tais, you can, it'll, you'll last a week drinking Mai Tais on a beach before you're like, I'm over this. What I need, some, I need some purpose in life again. Yep, exactly. That purpose is so important. So Mark, Mark, let's talk about the, the different businesses you've started. I know that since you've left corporate America, you've pretty much exploded in all these ideas. And I, I feel you with that. You know, we have, we have the newsletter, we have the podcast, we have the community, we have the, the coaching, we have public speaking. You know, talk about the different things you have. You have Holden, you have uh, Vanguard, you have, uh, don't you have a, a newsletter and some other things going on as well? Yeah, sure thing. Let's, let's, let's kind of outline that out. So yeah, Kevin, as you mentioned, once you go from a W2 single income stream, it's probably apt to diversify into something more um, sustainable over time. So yeah, so I started off just doing generalized consulting. I, I started consulting years before I went off on my own, um, just to one, build my book of business, one, be able to start uh, raising my rates to something that was sustainable, um, and to two, to get a couple, three, to just get a couple of like reps under my belt. So I started off with high dollar consulting. Um, and from there, um, you know, when I left, I was like, what do I have? Right. I got a Rolodex of some businesses that pay me a decent amount of money to talk about, you know, investments and things like that in defense and aerospace. But I realized I had this beautiful thing on LinkedIn, right? I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on Instagram, but I am on LinkedIn. And I, you know, I, for those who follow me on LinkedIn, kind of know my journey. I just started posting every single day on LinkedIn about eight, eight or nine months before I left corporate America. And if and, you don't follow him, definitely follow Mark yeah. Holden. He, had, he has some great content out there, especially in the aviation space enjoy airplanes or anything defense story related. Uh, love the opportunity to share my content with you. But yeah, man, started creating content. And then, you know, like LinkedIn doesn't pay you to create the content. So I went over to YouTube and created a bunch of videos and, you know, got a channel monetized and, you know, and then saw my first paycheck after all my monetized videos and was like, well, this sucks. This is not the way, but I do have a monetized <laughs> YouTube. It is making money, but it is embarrassing. amounts of low money. And to show me that the ROI just wasn't worth it. YouTube. So I doubled down on LinkedIn and I did that a couple of different ways. Q, like, you know, last quarter of last year, um, I finally launched a, a, you know, community that I've been building for a few months called the Vanguard. So, you know, I spent a lot of time at trade shows. That's where a lot of the conversation in defense and aerospace happens. That's where our community really connects. But in absence of those big trade shows a couple of times a year, the, the conversation just started happening on LinkedIn. And then we started noticing one a heck of a lot of spam on LinkedIn to a lot of like a lot of individuals that were, you know, there were executives and innovators that were just trying to make a think their name in, in, in defense and aerospace. Like they just hung their thoughts on LinkedIn. And then the conversation would just happen on LinkedIn. Information was being siloed. And because of this, we just like, we needed to have a forum outside of a compromised social media platform just to have conversations, just to talk about the future because like we are heading towards three very scary world wars. We talked about them a little bit earlier today, right? Like all of those things could could be our next great war, right? All at once, mm -hmm. this three front mega problem. And we do not have the industry capacity or communication to be able to scale a production capacity to be able to support a three front war like we did a two front war back in World War II, right? We, we planned for years to get ourselves into that war. We could, like China could take Taiwan tomorrow. And so... You know, for us, it's it's a big focus on just making sure we're building capacity and have a place to build communication. So we've got a bunch of innovators and, and uh, executives that are in the defense and aerospace industry, either at the late stages of their career or just starting to break into the defense and aerospace where, you know, we do, we do a bunch of mentoring. We do a bunch of communications. We actually do some in-person meetups. We did a we did an in-person meetup in Vegas uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is a good time for nice. Shot Show, and we had a bunch of our members there and had a good old time burning it down. But so community is so important to me. I'm I'm such a proud member of the Vetrepreneur Collective. We all all three of us are, which is a community for veterans, 
uh, to be able to get together and learn how to thrive outside of this military of ours and certainly proctored by you, Kevin and Greg. I've certainly appreciated that. And I've found a, just a bunch of good connections in there. So shameless plug, like, yes, I run Much a community, but I am a member of communities. I be, like, I truly believe community is the future. I am a member of a community as I am a, a, a community leader. Um, and I, I just believe it's the way. So like, if you're a, if you're an executive and an innovator in defense and aerospace and you're curious about, about what's behind the curtain of Vanguard, we got a three, free month go for it. But if you're a veteran and you're just like trying to figure out like where to go next, who to talk to next, you don't have the Rolodex you thought you did when you got out of the military or you got that first program manager job and you realized that wasn't for you and you really wanted to do something to execute some sovereignty. The Vetrepreneur Collective is just the place to be. I'm so excited to have that thing grow. I look forward to that being this thriving 100,000 person community at some point in the future. That'd be um, so amazing. <laughs> and man, I, Kevin, Greg, like you guys have taken the torch. No one asked you to, no one told you to. Like you executed on your own accord, sua sponte, right? You said, okay, like someone needs to carry the torch for these veterans, right? And it was, of course, it was a couple of, a couple of special operators that decided to stack hands and get it done. <laughs> But man, you guys have done such a big, such a big, um, such a big impact with with that community and Venture Burner Collective. So, oh, what I else? Appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate I've got a new that. butter. Sorry, go for it, Greg. Let's talk. About I was this. gonna say Sue Sponte would have been a good. That would have been another good uh, podcast name because that is oh, very much. That is a great like, name. That is pretty much how we've done this. Is just. To Sue Sponte, Sponte the shit out of like everything we've done. <laughs> Send it. I mean, <laughs> Mark, it. Mark, still waiting for your podcast. You, you can snag that. That name. yeah. Oh, here, here's the deal. Ooh. So fun story. I actually started a podcast. I recorded a couple episodes um, and then I never released them because I realized that that was one more creator trap that I did not want to get myself into. It's, it is um, a lot. It is a we lot. We were just talking I, about it. Yep. It is a lot. I wanted to, cause, oh God, I want to do a podcast for so many reasons. One, it's like, great, right? I go after this thing, I'm going to have a ton of video uh, that I can pop out in shorts and great content. It's good for me to build social proof. I get people like I've done podcasts in the past. I have people that reach out to me, Mark. So you're on the podcast. Let's talk. Right. I think it's so important, but it is, um, it's a bit, it's a, it's a slog. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work post. It's a lot. Of, I like, love the discussion. I didn't like the work post. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, that was, I think why I, I didn't release them. Well, I think you can, you can make it a sustainable thing. It really depends what, what the ultimate outcome is. Like, are you trying to monetize it? Are you trying to make this big thing where you're, you're solely focused on, on that revenue stream or are you using it to get a message out there to build credibility? Um, and do it in a sustainable way. You know, if you do one a week, one every two weeks, you just like, hey, I, I know that I'm only going to interview the one person for this for this week or these this this month. Just put it out there, build it into your website. Um, you know, don't even do the YouTube version. Just do the audio, put it on onto a, a stack. Then you can just have some very frank, detailed conversations. You're not trying to reach out and find sponsors. You're not trying to get a massive following. But when people have questions, you can now point point back to this location of you know, just like a newsletter. You, you, you wrote this detailed article with a uh, whole lot of insight and opinion and and and, and philosophy about you know what what's going to be going forward. Now you can just point back to this episode and be like, yeah, I talked with I don't know the CEO of Boeing. If you're able to pull that one, um, and now you can have that that credibility. You can have those, those conversations and just build in, into the community that way. But yeah, you know, it, I, I'm completely in agreement with you that all these things take time. You know, we, we were just talking about it. We had five, well, we'll have five podcast interviews this week alone. Um, and it's just, it, it turns into a lot. You need to put in safeguards so that you don't get overwhelmed and burnt out and, and just let it fall to the wayside because that's just what happens with content creators. They get, they get burnt out and they, they just let it die on the vine because they don't have the time. They don't have the resilience. They don't have the, um, the, the long-term vision of what things could be. Yep. And that vision is so important. The resiliency, the steadfastness is so important. Like it takes a year of shouting into a void as a content creator these days to actually like hear an echo back. And it takes a mm -hmm. year of rejection. It takes a year of this weird building cycle. And once you get there and you got your millions of impressions a month, like you wanted, like you still want more, you still aren't sure if it's the right thing, right? It's, it doesn't matter. Like it's just, it's just the nature of the beast, man. But it's so oh, it's, important. It's, you're right. It's crazy how how quickly the mind adapts and it's like, okay, this is the new standard. I want more. I, I know that you you just posted like you've been building, I think, actively on LinkedIn for about eighteen months now. And you we talked yep. about your story. If you want to dive into how you got into it and where you find your path, but you know, 
when you finally hit a, a high metric, you now like you, you now measure all other uh, posts and achievement and, and, and metrics off that one, even though that one might be out an outlier. Uh, you, you're just like, well, this is the new standard, and I'm not going to be happy now until I surpass that one. And it's just this ever moving goalpost of uh, of growth and success. And, and I'm okay with it, right? Like I'm okay with a few of those traps because it is a trap. Like it, you do get yourself into this thing. Uh, called dopamine the dumps. Trap. Oh, the dopamine dumps are real, right? Totally real. <laughs> but it's, you know, it, it it's a it's a fascinating concept, right? Because here I am, just like random kid from Massachusetts. You know, just spent a little bit of time at war, did little, little little things in corporate America. But like, I found a voice on LinkedIn, right? I talk to a lot of people every month now. It's pretty cool to be able to, and like anybody can do that, right? Anybody can do that. Mm-hmm. That's the cool thing. It's like a, it's a pretty even playing field as long as you have the vision and the steadfastness, and you're okay with shouting into a void for a year before you can go back and learn. But like. Again, LinkedIn is the undefended flank right now in in social media, right? In, in this weird realm where like TikTok eventually will go away in 18 months. TikTok will not be a part of the United States like case anymore. In a world where people are not trusting like Meta, Facebook, Instagram anymore. In a world where like Twitter and X are just like Twitter or X, however you want to talk about it. Um, or thread it's like spat match <laughs> you know it's this like it's just this spat match like linkedin's a professionals platform like i'm not going to go try to sell my services on instagram or facebook to anybody because my customer ain't there but they are on linkedin and that's where i get you know 90 percent of mm-hmm. my business comes in through linkedin the other 10 percent of the business comes in through me going to companies and saying like i'm irrationally excited about your product we've got to find a way to work together right everything else is just linkedin so in it, it, it's all about it's all about leverage, right? It's all leverage of your time, leverage of your energy. When I looked at YouTube, right, relatively low low leverage for me because it was, took a lot of work and it was very expensive to get high quality, you know, a couple minutes of content in. Whereas LinkedIn, I can just like, you know, sip a cup of coffee and bang out a cool post about the, you know, the type of fuel the SR-71 used and you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll get a couple hundred thousand impressions. Like that's just kind of yeah. how, how it is. Jump on Canva real quick, make a cool image. Yeah, exactly. Throw my yeah. little picture on the bottom, call it good. <laughs> little CTA yeah. and we're set. How, how did um, you find your voice? Because I know, I know you've jumped around a, a few different times yep. as you're like, I could talk about this. Didn't really get the reaction. Didn't really enjoy that. Shifted. You know, and now you're really cruising. I think you said you had a, a 6 million impression month, which is massive. Yeah, that, that and that turned into, uh, since we've talked, uh, just about 8.5 million impression months. So that's where I'm at this month, about 8.5 million awesome impressions. Awesome work. Now, that it's was, crazy. um, like and that, that's the new metric. So yeah, every month needs to be better right? than that, or you're not going to be happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how did I find my voice? I, um, I woke up December 12th of, uh, 2022 and realized like I just needed to get my life together and needed to build something that I could execute independently and was not at the, he- at the behest of like this corporate overlord that I was with at the time. And so I started like posting and I would, post cheesy bro a tree and little like this is what i think about mindfulness and like little bro a tree bro bro make note of that word bro a tree bro a tree this is Uh, like a the the justin welsh um style of discussion where you're just like you know he's throwing stones the nine to five and he's getting all like bad boy about you know corporate america like that's the corporate anarchy guru yeah you got it that's the bro tree that started off you know after justin wells launched his course so yeah i paid my 125 bucks i took an online course on linkedin so you had to be but in all serious justin wells if you're listening we'll talk to you you've been game changer (laughs) and how we've done our stuff we're not talking shit we appreciate everything you've done yeah, and that's it, right? So like I took a Justin Wells course and then started posting every day on LinkedIn using those those things and a year later here I am, right? Um so I, I started off try recognizing that riches lie in niches and so I niched down a little bit. I was like, "Oh, I was the Arctic warfare for a little bit. I was the Arctic warfare guy for a little bit." And I was the Arctic warfare guy because I got a You've got a ranch that is like in the high alpines of very snowy Wyoming. <laughs> and I was like, this is a great place. Like, this is the perfect Arctic proving ground. High altitude, super cold, like do some Arctic stuff. And then I realized that like there were a lot of people that were really, really smart on Arctic stuff that um, they were they were, uh, they were were really well respected. But like the community was so small. The people who like gave a shit about Arctic warfare was so small. And it was just not super viable. So that became something I talked about. And then I continued to pivot. I talked a lot about, uh, again, you know, like you know, a lot post-traumatic growth. I did talk about that for a little bit, right? So we talk about PTSD and all these veterans with PTSD. And, and really it was like big thing for me was framing this post-traumatic depression 
to growth, recognizing that like this, uh, the sum total human I am today is because of the terrible experiences I've had in service. And so I've, you know, I did the PTS PTG guy for a little bit. And then again, just, then I was like the trade show. I'm going to update you from the trade show guy. And, and then I went back, I, I just, I just kind of fumbled around for a year. And then I, at that year, Mark, I took a, took a look back. I snapped the chalk line. I looked back and I said, what was successful? And I had a couple of peaks in my year. So what were those peaks? Well, I was talking about airplanes, what airplanes we'll list them all down. And then I was like, all right, let me formulate a, a, you know, a firing solution here. Let me shoot my shot. Started to get good traction. Let me try it again. Good traction. Fire for effect. Good traction. And now I'm just repeating rounds all day. It's just like, I got a, I got a running backlog of a hundred pieces of content at any given time. Um, you know, all about aviation and stuff like that. And I mix it in, right? So not all my stuff was aviation. And I think that was a just to talk on a concern of mine, you know, coming into scaling a newsletter, scaling my next project that I'm working on. I had a really big concern. Like I woke up one morning in panic, realizing that all of the whatever 14, well now like 18,000 people that I've got in my network, like just cared about aviation and they didn't want anything else. Um, jumping in with the Vanguard, having another offering for that audience led me to believe that like, yep, okay, it's not just airplane people. They care about other stuff too. Um, you know, once I started launching my newsletter and converting people through newsletter, I realized again, like the 3,300 people in change now 34 I've got in my newsletter. Like that's like, they have a certain expectation of the content that I deliver to them and they're willing to pay for certain things. And, um, but it, it takes time finding that voice. And it, then it, again, it just took me to commitment, it took commitment to be active in the comment section on your LinkedIn profile. It took commitment to post every single day. It commit, took commitment to like do post mission analysis to recognize like, how is my dissemination strategy? What do I need to do to up, up, up it? Like what other levers and knobs do I need to expose in my social media strategy to allow me to thrive as a content creator? And now today, like, I'm very excited to announce that like I've now have, like I have, I'm, I'm being paid for my stuff on LinkedIn now. It's very exciting. I've got companies that seek me out for sponsored content. I've got companies that work with me to grow their LinkedIn presence. Um, I've got companies that I work with that will like call me in for LinkedIn training. And this isn't stuff I advertise ever. Like mm -hmm. I'm not advertising. I'm not, I, I am not a LinkedIn guru. I just <laughs> have some notes that I took over the last 18 months or so, but I've got a lot of companies that are interested in growing on LinkedIn, because, especially in defense and aerospace, because if we're slinging whatever Stanley cups, like I'm not slinging them on LinkedIn, I'm slinging them on TikTok and Instagram and stuff like that, but we're slinging defense equipment systems of consequence right no one gives a shit yeah. about that stuff on tiktok it's about linkedin that's where the influencers are and the data available to you on linkedin is huge and it's so hard to get traction and if you can get traction keep the traction um and then in turn again those you know going over to a company and saying like hey this is the amount of pressions i get a month i'd love to be able to work and, and grow you know awareness of your brand of your product grow awareness of your um you know of your event it's it's um LinkedIn is a pretty high leverage platform. Well, I think you nailed it earlier when you said that that LinkedIn is the unguarded flank of, of social media. I think a lot of people and businesses have been ignoring it. They've been like, well, we have Facebook and Facebook ads and Google ads and um, all these other things where they saw that as the, the high ticket uh, ROI. And people are seeing that they want to have that, that more personable interaction where an ad, you know, you run it, people click on it maybe. But if, if people can have a spot where they can actually interact with, you know, maybe another human, maybe a bot, I don't know what, what's going on in the back end marketing sure. or uh, social media content side of a, of a business. But, you know, you'd hope it's, it's another person that you can engage with on in the comment section. And LinkedIn has done a remarkable job of keeping those dialogues open and making businesses and people much more human and personable and, and relatable. And so if you're, if you're someone that's been in that that one percent of content creator, and I'm not saying content creators are the job, but like there's only one percent of, of people on each social media platform that actually create original content. I think the, the rule is like one percent create, nine yep. percent curate, and ninety percent just consume. Yep. Uh, so if you're in that one percent side that can teach a business how to manage their LinkedIn profile and, and their account, and there's huge money in that because it's just been so ignored for so long. Uh, if if they can get an ROI for thousands of dollars in the defense space, you know, you land one contract, that's millions of dollars. So that, yeah. that is a huge margin. Yeah. It's huge. It's high leverage. And again, like people have jobs, people on LinkedIn have jobs, right? People on Instagram mm -hmm. have dreams. 
And so like, that's where you've got to, you've got to, you've got to go for your, your buying behavior and things like that. And again, like I'm far from a guru, but it's, it's free advertising dollars. It's like, what would you pay to get your name and your business in front of eight and a half million people this month, 9 million people this month, maybe it's a million and a half next month. But like, I don't know, man, that'd be really expensive for me to do Google ads on that. And you don't know who is sending it to, you don't know if it's high quality yeah. leads like this is no, I, I can hit the 10 ring on the center mass of my target of audience every single day, because I again, LinkedIn provides the, 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 the ability to do that through groups. I was about to say, LinkedIn gives you those metrics. You'd be like, who's seen this post? And it's like CEOs yeah. of companies, founders of companies, yep. tech and defense yep. space. Like, I can oh. show you exactly who's seen my content and be like, is this someone you're interested in, in communicating with? Yep. For so free. Like, it's included. Yep. That's it. So I've got a slick sheet, right? That says all that. I keep it updated. This is how many people I've talked to. This is the segmentation of that. This is the segmentation of uniform services versus like defense aerospace leadership. And um, this is how many CEOs to founders I've got and um, in my network. And and yeah, it's like, it's, it's social, like social selling is so important these days. It's a high, especially with products where social proof is so important. Um, LinkedIn is just that platform to be able to do that. And again, it's free advertising. Greg, what do you got, well, man? Then you got the great, Vanguard, man. Say again? Like the, I, then you got the Vanguard too. Cause I mean, I, at the end of the day, as that thing grows, you're going to be like, I have this group of like thousands of people in the defense space in a community and I'm the owner of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I can, I can you know, plug this wherever and it's going to get in front of like a thousand, thousands of people in the right space. Uh, that, that's why I'm so bullish on com community too. It's, it's, yep. it's a no brainer. Man, and it was, um, you know, I, I, I went back and forth on the community thing so many times and it's like, you know, it's like it's paid communities versus free communities. It's like, why, like, is this thing different than LinkedIn? The answer is like, absolutely. It's different than LinkedIn. And what's so surprising to me as a community, like a young growing community leader is how many people love the community aspect. They just like needed it in their mm -hmm. life and they didn't know it. They needed it in their life. And I like I thought I was creating this big secure place for people to talk and create conversation and build capacity and like yeah we're doing all that stuff, but people love being part of that community and like once we started meeting up in person and started having like coffee hours and we do like working sessions where we're all rallying and helping people out like people come out of those those like engagements so invigorated to like give back into that community again and. Um, you know, it was something I didn't know I needed, right? I didn't know I needed it. It was a th hypothesis of mine. I was building a community and then the entrepreneur kind of came into my life and, and was able to jump on board and was like, oh yeah, like I am building the right thing on the right platform because these guys are doing a great thing. And it's been great. I think we've probably seen, you know, the numbers triple in the entrepreneur Collective since since I've hopped it, on board. And, we just and, broke 50. Boom, there you go. Um, so it's great, you know, to see to see that growth, to see what's like, what for me, especially Vetrepreneur Collective, and we do see this with Vanguard as well, is it's not the growth, but the retention that excites mm -hmm. me, right? It's like community leader for me. I'm not like my goal for the first year of my community is not to grow my community, but to retain the community members that I do have and to ensure that they have unadulterated access to the things that we promised and that they have uh, just like a, a, an a irrational excitement for the value of the community that they're getting. And, and like, that's what I've tried to do. We try to strive for that. And it's been very successful both in, in both of our communities, but I'm so excited sure. again about the people that choose to stay into the community, choose to, you know, be part of that, spend their time supporting others, knowing that they're due for their receipt of support whenever they ask for it. It's, it's huge, man. And you just, like there's a lot that I can't say on LinkedIn. There's a lot that I won't say on various social media sites. One to professional, it's a professional's platform. So there's stuff so that I, I can't say in conversations I don't want to have on LinkedIn, but I still need to have them or we still need to just talk about them. Um, and we need to secure a relatively you know, a supportive place to do that with the right other members in that room to help be that rising tide to lift all boats. It's so yeah. important, but it's, it's an effective way to do it. Yeah, and communities are a great way to... You know, really under promise and over deliver have, have huge value for very little cost. Like yep. we charge $20 a month to, to get that. And we, we bring in some incredible experts in the space and we have corporate attorneys, we have uh, fundraising gurus, we have networking masters, we have all kinds of great people that are imparting their information for 20 bucks a month. Like you, you go out and get Chipotle and it's going to cost you more than that. Um, and you're, you're learning, you're interacting, you're, you're growing your network. Um, as you mentioned, you're feeling co confidence and, 
a sense of connectedness. People just want to have that that tribe they're a part of. And Greg and I were actually, well, Greg's actually the reason why we, we launched the the community when we did. He's like, dude, just pull the trigger. Go yeah. I've been heeing and hawing. I'm like, they got these ideas. You know, can I do a Slack channel? Can I do this? He's like, dude, just do it. Just do it. We'll, we'll figure it out on the on the way. Um, we'll make it work. Uh, so so spontaneous. That's what. That's why you got to have great business partners. They're just like, dude, just do it. <laughs> stop, stop dicking around. <laughs> um, but we were just talking about how, like how how much people want to have that that outward display of being a part of the community. It's the same reason people wear um, team jerseys yep. in, in their hometown. Like they're not part of that team, but they identify with it. And so we were talking about putting, um, uh, you know, on on yeah, someone's experience, putting Vetrepreneur Collective member. Uh, so that people can outwardly display that they're a part of this community with pride and, you know, start conversation. Be like, if you're, you're a veteran, even if you're not interested in entrepreneurship, join the community, learn about it. Maybe there's something in there that, that will excite you. If you are interested, then definitely come on over and, and talk about it. But having that, that badge on there, that, that experience marker shows that someone is knowledgeable in that space and people can reach out and ask uh, to, to get more information from, from them. So it doesn't have to be a centralized repository of information between Greg and me, it can now be every member of that community can promote it and, and make it into what they want it to be. Because ultimately, I don't want the community to be me, an extension of me. I want it to be an extension of everybody who's part of it. Yep. And that's so important. I, I say this twice a week as well. We live stream twice a week and at least twice a week in Vanguard. And I, I started off with the same thing as like this community, myself, this is the medium, not the message. You are the message, right? This is the medium. This is where we have those conversations, but I am not the conversation. You are not the conversation, right? The community is not the conversation. It's like the place where we have that conversation. So we try to be the medium and not the message and just try to, again, have that safe space. Greg, I'd love to know a little bit more about MedTech Militia. So we talk about communities, right? I think you started like... Uh, tell me, like, if you if you're open to it on this forum, man, I'd love to learn a little bit more about like, like that seems like it's been around for a little bit. Like, where did you start it? Why? Because that's like early days community, man. How has it been growing? Like, just give me a hot take yeah. on MedTech Militia. Yeah. So MedTech Militia is, you know, it's kind of what I like, got me and Kevin talking about building out the Vetrepreneur Collective is is MedTech Militia, and it's it really stemmed from my time in recruiting. Uh, where I was getting hit up all the time by people in the med tech space saying like, Hey, do you have any jobs with, for my specific background? It's like, no, dude, I, I can't just pull jobs out of my ass. Um, but what I can do is I can put you in a community with a bunch of other people in the med tech space that could eventually, um, hopefully help allow you to network into, to, into the next opportunity. So that was really the onus behind starting med tech Moshe. It's very similar, set up the same way, 20 bucks a month. It's a Slack channel. Um, we meet every couple of weeks as a group um, to either just spitball ideas, figure out how we can help each other. We'll also have um, guest speakers on there as well. Um, so it's it's a very, very similar setup, but it really stemmed from the recruiting side. And ultimately, um, if I do end up sticking with uh, recruiting in the med tech space, because I'd but just, I'll just be frank. I want to get, I want to get away with it just because, or get away from it just because I'm in the Netherlands now and yeah. uh, trying to talk to candidates at like 11 and 12 at night is like not my idea of a good time. So I am definitely phasing that side out, but there's some other opportunities that have stemmed from that, um, that are, that are pretty cool, um, in terms of being able to identify distributors in the, in the med tech space to, cause startups are always looking to not to bring on headcount, right? They'd rather just bring on a distributor. And so, but there's not recruiters out there that specialize in bringing on distributors just because there's no really payment model that makes sense. So that's the kind of area that we've wiggled our way into. And that's, that's where I'd like to stay because that is like zero lift for me. It's just like sending out a, a weekly or a monthly newsletter that says like, Hey, these are the distributor opportunities that I have available. And if anybody's interested, I'd, connect them and get a little bit of a, a payout for a contract that's signed. Sure. I love it. You know, when I think about, yeah. um, you know, when I was thinking about creating communities, it was like, I think every, I, a lot of us probably went through the same thing. It was like, Oh, I'm going to create a online coaching program and then I'm going to create a course and then create a podcast around that course. And then I'll create a newsletter and I'm going to monetize that newsletter. Right. And then it's just like, you're building all these things. And I think like skating to where the puck's going to be in 24, 25, 26 is it's like skipping all that going right to community, 
that's where solopreneurs can kind of grow and scale and, and get themselves off of that, like build themselves sustainable recurring income to allow them to continue to give back to that community. Greg, yeah, when you think subscription about subscription membership um, model is, is huge. Yep. It's yeah. so, and there's a, like you said it earlier, like whatever, whatever, however much it is a year, depending on how you price a community. Like if you can at least give that individual member 10 X their value you know, per month, if I can get, because I know I did like within mm -hmm. six hours of joining the Vetrapreneur Collective, I got my 20 bucks. I got like way more than my 20 bucks worth, right? It was like immediately, immediate return on investment just because of the conversation that was going on in there. Um, and from a, you know, as a solopreneur, like, or as an entrepreneur, creating recurring <laughs> revenue is so important. Other than, it's, it's selling a $20 ebook or selling access to the knowledge in that ebook for 20 bucks a month, right? That's mm -hmm. it's a little bit bigger. Greg, when you think about MedTech Militia and kind of exiting that, do you think about a liquidity event? Like, do you think about selling off this thing that you've built or do you think about just quietly shutting it down? No, I'll keep, I'll keep it going because I have business partners that are sure. like more heavily involved in the MedTech space. Yep. Um, so we'll, we'll keep it running and I'll just kind of be phasing out the recruiting side of it and sure. giving them probably more because it's really, it's, it's a good, it's a good brand. Um, it's, carries some weight. And I think that it's, it's like, if you're going to be writing on LinkedIn, you might as well, like, and you're in the med tech space, like you might as well write with behind the name of med tech militia and have something that like you're funneling people into. So I think we're, I, I think we've got a pretty good alignment, um, on the business partner front where I can just kind of be a silent partner in the back and sort of allow that to, to flourish and just help out where needed. Awesome. Not, not to get uh, tangential here, but Greg, how'd you get into med tech sales? Yeah. So it was a green beret medic. Uh, so yeah, no, no, was it was either getting, <laughs> yeah, getting, getting out. It was either go Fishing. to PA school or <laughs> yeah, or, uh, or go, go to the med device route. And that's, that's the route I took. I heard, heard. Yeah. That's awesome. That's good stuff. It's worked out well for you. And good Greg, for you. Greg's yeah. a bit humble about his, his background and story. He, he keeps everything very close held. Uh, it takes a little bit of effort <laughs> to, to pull the string of, of hearing his story going from, uh, as he describes it, going from a fairly affluent family, deciding to to join the, the military. And if you're going to join the military, why not go one of the hardest routes you, you can? I say one of the, because you know, <laughs> slight competition between <laughs> between organizations. Um, having never gone through Q course or, or SF training, I'm sure it's brutal in, in their own regard. Um, but yeah, he... I'd love to get, we're, we're definitely gonna have to have a podcast episode of just him and I, so I can pull some of this information out for, for the audience to hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's important, right? Yeah. The 18 Delta of course is, is, you know, arguably the intellectually potentially the second hardest or hardest, right. Depending on how you cut it course in, for elites enlisted, right. I say enlisted because there's like astronaut training programs and fire pilots <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that. That like maybe is a little bit more academically challenging, but like, I mean, the 18 Delta Sockham program is right up there with Navy EOD, which is like a 56 week technological oh, course on disarming diesel electric ignition yeah. systems and shit. But yeah, man, good for you. Like, and, and good for you for not going the PA route like too many times. I think SC 68 whiskeys, 18 Deltas, you know, folks that are coming at PJs, right? That just just do the PA route, or and that's that's awesome, right? If you want to continue in medicine, I don't know about you, but I felt like coming out a couple of pushes overseas, like the I couldn't do a hospital setting anymore. Um, and yeah. I just did not want to do medicine after too much trauma on the battlefield, like in a clinical setting, I should say. Yeah, I had, I mean, there, there was no way I was going to make it work anyways, just because I had <laughs> kid and another kid yeah. on the way at the time. And, and there was no school in the Springs, like close by. So I, sure. there was no, there was no way it was going to happen. Um, so I entertained it for a little bit, but yeah. I, and like think to think that I would have been coming out of that at like the height of COVID yeah. and rolling into like my first year as a PA during COVID would be, oh that would have been God. fucking miserable. Yeah, nightmare, <laughs> nightmare scenario, right? Yeah. There. I dodged a bullet. I dodged a bullet. Okay. Good for you. Well, you made, you made, we know the story ended, man. You made it work and uh, good for you. That's a successful transition. What's uh, it's like, what's next for you, Greg, after like, you, you made this transition off to Europe, like you're living, you're living in Europe right now. Like you've left the beautiful state of Colorado you were trying to rally with time zones. Like what's, you know, what's your big focus now, man? Like what's, what are you excited about? 
Yeah, Vet Collective is yeah. like obviously when we, this is this is keeping me really busy. We're doing the Hard Not Smarter podcast. Like, what we've got five this week, sixteen yep. in the next like three weeks. So yeah. just that's that's been keeping me busy. And then I also have a another startup in the um, mental health space. It's a mental health like emotional intelligence tool um, that's yep. leveraging AI. So Love we're it. sort of in stealth mode, trying to bootstrap it. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll have like we. We're, we're getting there. Couple next couple of months, we'll probably probably launch and hopefully have a hopefully have a, a client on board. That's exciting. That's good for you, man. Way to uh, way to give back to. You. That's such a such a poignant tool, right? You, you talk a lot about mental health, Greg, and a lot of wellness. I really appreciate your content. I think you know it's there's a little bit of um, there's always a stigma, man. There's always a stigma about talking about some of the the stuff you're not supposed you're not not nothing you're not supposed to talk about. You just don't talk about. We just don't don't hear very much. And one of the things I re- really appreciate about your content, Greg, is you do like talk about that mental health piece. You do allow yourself and by nature, your audience to like be vulnerable with you. And I think that's such an important part of being like bringing your whole self to a social media platform and being a whole self creator that like you are bringing that uncomfortable bit talking about, you know, the, the, the not so sexy side of like being a veteran being in the military and things like that, man. So I just want to just want to take a second to celebrate that and appreciate the, the content you do produce. Cause again, it is, you are being vulnerable doing it. It's not easy to do that, but I know it's an important part of um, allowing your audience and your your community to grow uh, with you. So good for you, man. Yeah, one hundred percent, man. Mental health in the veteran space, obviously, just a huge. It's a huge issue, and yep. and men in general are just terrible at talking about mental health. So yep. trying to break that down a little bit and just show people that, like, dude, I'm just like a fucking normal ass dude, <laughs> um, and I had mental health issues, and like, I got over it, and I'm medicated now, and hopefully, I won't be in the in the future, but it works for me, and here I am. So, I'm just, I'm just fucking human, you know? Yeah, man. And We're all human, uh, right? That's what people. Yeah. People need to know that, right? You are. You both were superheroes in your prior life, like absolute top notch tier one superheroes, but now, like, you're just normal civilians with a whole lot of scary stuff behind you right and it's about rationalizing all that and looking forward and realize like you both have young children like you've got to be a father to those children you've got to be a husband to your wife in the midst of all of that chaos in the storm inside of your minds and so good for you whether it's um you know whether it's pharmaceuticals or natural whether it's mindfulness or, or discussion like whatever whether it's running really really fast until you're really really tired or it's playing <laughs> video games like everybody's got their own different way to cope but you've got to have those, those spots in there and you've got to have like a place to talk about it. Like you said, like Greg men are terrible at talking. Veterans are terrible at talking about PTSD, PTSG and all that stuff that's required for us. And it's good for you again, being a, being the medium, not the message, but also a resource for us um, to know that there are like, we can talk about it. We have a space and opportunity to talk about. It. There are other people that are talking about it and currently struggling with it. And so super powerful. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's you, that's one of the reasons why we, branded the harder not smarter podcast what we did we were looking at like elite veterans and veteran ventures and things like that but like it's, it's too business focused and neither yeah. one of us wants to talk solely business yep. uh and we also wanted to have a good humor side because some of the things we talk about are tough and if you're you're just doing the the super uh super deep technical dive of these things it gets very dry and, and dark and so by having the humorous outlet of, you know, sometimes you have to push your head, put your head down and run through that brick wall. There isn't a smarter way around to get around mental health. Um, and, and so by opening the aperture of what this podcast can be, and now allows us to have guests in that space. Like we're, we're going to be talking with the, the founders of wave neuro, a, nice. um, a, a mental stimulation, a brain stimulation business that is working with wounded warrior and, um, uh, the special operations foundation. Um, we're talking with some, uh, psychedelic assisted therapy, people, ketamine assisted therapy, yep. um, and m- meditation, mindfulness, all these topics can be, can be broached now on a single platform. So it's not just business, business, business. It's, Oh, you want to start a, You want to start a business? Here's, here's that, but here's also the mindset side of it. And if you're struggling with PTSD or other issues, here's some, some, uh, information on that. And it really just, it, it opens it up to a, the large, Sorry, the larger uh, veteran community, which we're we're extremely diverse in, and uh, and and different, and so we wanted to be able to help as many veterans as possible. And Greg was a huge factor in in branding us that way. Yeah, that's so important, especially now more than ever, right? And like you mentioned, like maybe I don't want to talk about psychedelics on LinkedIn, but maybe I want to talk about them in a particular community, right? Like you got to mm-hmm. have spaces to talk and have those discussions. 
Um, but at the same time, man, like veterans are so mission driven. You can't have a conversation about what they're doing without talking about where they've been and what their continuing missions are. Cause I don't like, I'm still serving, right? Like the work I do in the defense industrial base is a direct extension of the work I did on the battlefield. And what I've come to realize is that myself standing up growth engine lines of business across the defense industrial base for, you know, a little, a little under a decade was I was way more effective, you know, in the future fight setting up those lines of business, creating technology that saves lives and livelihoods, ensuring that those technologies got their arms and got their way into the, into the soldiers and sailors, airmen, Marines, space force guardians that will use them like a way more effective doing that than I ever was a single gun on the battlefield. Come on. So for me, it's like, it's a, it's a direct extension of my continual service. Like I will continually serve this nation. I will continually serve the taxpayers. I will continually serve the individuals who sign on that dotted line and like, sign up to go to war and we'll do that and you know some total of my life like i'm here to reduce organic tissue damage in the battlefield that's my mission right I did that initially through battlefield medical care and well you did that initially in corporate america through the advent of uncrewed or unmanned systems um re replacing those dull dir dirty dumb and dangerous jobs i did this with taser and my time at axon where we were taking less than lethal technology and you know, making sure that our Troops, both overseas, domestically, our civilians that protected them, our federal civilians that, you know, go out there and support uh, the, this nation, like, had options other than their hands and a pistol, right, through through less than lethal technologies. And so, for mm -hmm. me, like, everything I do is rooted in that mission. And I can't talk about, you know, this newsletter I've got without talking about where I came from to inform it, right? I can't talk about this next venture I've got without talking about, you know, the the products that I've used and then how I've gotten there with that stuff. And And, again, like, you can't talk to veterans, about what they're doing without talking about where they came from because that informs so much of it so i love the approach that you guys have for this thing i think it's such an important medium to have veterans need a place to talk and and veterans need a place to like talk with other veterans and this is, as acts as a great platform for individuals who are looking to you know get a name for themselves because i know your distribution between you two is absolutely insane uh, but it's also great to like, again, just be able to push that medium and continue to protract the mission that you, Kevin, you, Greg have like personally, professionally, and to, to be that rising tide that lifts all boats to have individuals here in this, this particular podcast, to talk about what's interesting to them to give them a platform. But you're asking like, you ask good questions, right? You ask questions that are thought provoking and podcasts are always fun. Cause you just, you just get to talk about yourself all the time. And so it's kind of, it's great that you have that, um, you have that. I've, I've had the opportunity to like listen to the prior podcast here. If there's that, if, if individuals have gotten to this podcast, go listen to the past ones. There's some awesome, awesome nuggets there, but I've learned so much already from the individuals you've brought on board. And when I look, you know, look forward to the next Thank 15 you. or whatever podcast you guys have, I, I know that you're just, you just like, you're just a little value. You're just like chucking value at cyclic guys, like between what you're doing <laughs> in the Vetrepreneur collective and you know, the massive amounts of value that we get for the 20 bucks a month that we put in there the just being like a member or just a follower of you on linkedin right we're just getting tons of value a couple times a day you know from you guys like it's it's huge you're just chucking tons of value i've got to imagine you guys subscribe to the law of abundance because you uh you mm -hmm. just give right there's so much you're given um and it's 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 needed there are a lot of people who need it and i'm just again beyond excited that this, this medium you guys have to be able to have this discussion well, I appreciate it. And we're, we're stoked to be able to support you on, on the same journey. I know that you're, yeah, man, especially when we first met, you were, you're still figuring out your voice and then you, you definitely yeah. hit it in stride since, uh, since then. Um, nice. so it, it really makes it Dude, it's been so much more enjoyable. Just like the last, just the last like three months has been, you're just like blown up. It's a rocket ship. Uh, you Thanks, were doing man. good three months ago, but like the last, like, it's been like, I don't know, man, I check out, I would like, Holy shit, dude. Mark shit's like all your always, stuff is always blowing up. I love it. It's, it's gotten parabolic. I found, um, you know, there's a difference between uh, content that, you know, maybe I want to talk about and then like engageable content and content that's shareable and engageable. And I've really cracked the nut on engageable content and I don't do it every single day, but you know, I, I know the levers and knobs I have in my content to be able to drive that up. And, and what I'm excited about now is just continuing to provide more offerings to that audience that I'm building. I think, um, you know, we've, through newsletter, through community, through consultancy, through, um, you know, some new offerings that are going to start coming online here in a couple of months. Like I'm excited about continuing to provide high value offerings to that audience because they are, um, you know, they're, they're trustworthy, right? They're like they, they, they spend money on you on the creators that they appreciate. And, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I've spent a lot of time talking to those audience, like trying to figure out what they want, trying to figure out what makes them tick. Like I'm fortunate again, not to be focusing on YouTube, just focusing on LinkedIn. And I've had the opportunity to follow in both of y'all's footsteps to grow. And so see one, do one, teach one, you know, doing one now, looking forward to teaching them in the future. But uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Like I'm just warming up. I feel like on this platform, like oh, yeah. you guys, right. It's just, just, you're like, I want to get to 10,000. When you get 10,000, you're like, all right, hundred, here we go. And now you just <laughs> on the launch log to hundred. And so that's the nature of the game. You're like, whatever I'm at 18,000 and change this morning. But, um, you know, for me, it's about like, those numbers don't mean anything anymore. It's about impressions. It's about engagement. Uh, yeah. It's about quality and it's about the amount of messages I get, you know, in, in the direct inbox. I think that's one thing that people don't see is where you, you see a lot of, um, you say you, you throw a post, a post out there in the void. You can see the comment section. You can see who engages on it, but the, you know, the creator gets a, usually gets some messages as a result of it oh, yeah. on the back end, either praising them for that work, challenging them against something they've said, asking for opportunity. Like there's a ton that goes on in the back end on LinkedIn. That's really exciting. And again, like, not gurus here, but have just learned a lot over the past to, to make this a repeatable, relatively successful program and a relative, relatively successful platform. Um, and I look forward to the improvements, right? LinkedIn needs to solve for live streams a lot better. LinkedIn needs to solve for pictures and video. And like, there's so much that the LinkedIn platform needs to grow in order for like us creators to continue to engage a little bit deeper with our audiences. But again, my big focus now is taking this rented land of LinkedIn and turning into owned land, right? Rented land, LinkedIn, rented land, YouTube, owned land, newsletter, owned yeah. land, community, owned yeah. land, email distro list newsletter, right? Not a, not yeah, a. As much as we love LinkedIn, if they have a change of uh, change of the guard and they, they, yep. they revamp their, their algorithm, um, there's nothing we can do to stop them. And that, that whole pop, or God forbid, they, they say we've broken their, their terms and conditions and they, they block our account. Like, yep. where do you go from there? If, if you, yep. if you've been relying on those platforms, you're beholden to them and, and their changes where community newsletters, podcasts, it, it gives you ownership of, of your audience, um, and, and longevity. Yeah. Yeah. So super important, man. And continuing to like build outside of LinkedIn is important. When I go to trade shows, I've got a, I've got a pocket full of business cards, but then aren't business cards for me. They're business cards for my, my community, right. With a fat discount code. And if I re meet people in the wild, I'm handing out those business cards and things like that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's continually to grow it, but yeah, you're right. Like we are one algorithm change away from being full stop on this platform. We're also one algorithm change away from, you know, going parabolic again. And so oh, for sure. you've got to ride with that, yeah, but yeah. it's so important that like after that first year or at some point, like you've just got to start um, crafting your own own land and figure out how you're going to either monetize or, or provide an offering to, um, you know, this particular audience that you've built and being able to scale that outside of the platform that you've built it on. Um, so, so, so important again, what you're doing with your newsletters and venture Prayer collective and where you're doing this podcast, it's just pulling it off a rented land, taking it into own land. And I think that's when you as creators start to achieve that huge growth. That's going to be huge. Now you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, Greg, do you have something? Yeah. There's one thing that I wanted to talk about because it just popped up in my head and thinking Dude. about Mark having a podcast that didn't, that he hasn't really, that hasn't, hasn't released yet. And I just want people to know um, some different tactics for for podcasts and something you might consider, Mark, where it's like it's not it's not as you won't take it as seriously, um, I guess, because it'll be for this purpose of business development, because there's a ton of people in the med tech space that have podcasts that nobody listened to, but they they shoot out a bunch of episodes and every person that they have on that is a potential client um, and oh, yeah, credibility because. Before. Yeah. So you have credibility because you have a ton of podcasts, which in a lot of people, like if you're, if you're going after a doctor, like they're going to be in market. I mean, if you put out a podcast, like people are, like, people are going to listen to it and you're going to have good numbers behind it anyways, yeah. um, just by the virtue of your followership um, and audience. But for even people that are like considering, Oh, well, should I start a podcast? I'm not, I don't know if I have like the, the audience for it, like start the podcast. If you want to do it just for business development purposes. Like I think of, you know, a ghostwriter or something like that, they could have potential clients that they want to write for on the, on the, on their podcast. Um, any, whatever it is, you just have potential clients and you give them a spotlight and you give them a plug on your, on your social media. And that's, that's a win. At, who are they going to turn to when they need your services? They're going to turn to you because you were on their podcast and you're the one person that they know and, and like, because you were on a podcast and you created some rapport. So I wanted to, I, I, 
had wanted to mention that. So bring that up now. Yeah, that's great stuff. And and uh, I, as I've been part of that, I've been, I've been on the other end of that where someone's trying to sell like sell me services, but it starts off in the form of a podcast, and it was great. Like it was awesome. I got to do a half hour podcast. I got some great content. I cut some great shorts out of it. Um, and yeah, if I ever need that individual services, like they put whatever you know half hour of their time an hour of their time against me i'm probably gonna give them a call back um but you're right like it podcasts don't need to be serious i think for me when i look at extensions of my brand it's like jumping in with both feet i don't want to half-ass anything i want to whole yeah. ass everything i put myself into and when you start uh like when you start a creative cycle you can't unscramble that egg you can't unring that bell like you've got to see it through because you'll undermine mm-hmm. trust in your audience if you don't deliver what you tell them you're it's gonna a great deliver point on. um and so i didn't want to do that like i I enjoyed it. I think one of the challenges that I had when I was doing it is like the podcasts I recorded were like three, three and a half hours long. They were long podcasts with folks that were just like that needed like a Rogan esque style discussion about everything. And that's good. But again, I just didn't have the time to record the amount of stuff I wanted to record. I didn't have the time to do the back end. Um, like, you know, losing the Riverside platform, it's never been easier now to start a podcast. It's so easy with yeah. you know, yeah. apps like Riverside. Just get after Riverside. Big plug to Riverside here. Yeah. Big this plug, makes it right? so much better. Mm-hmm. huge like I'll, I'll record a lot i even use riverside just for recording content like if i'm recording monologues or if i'm recording uh um because i'll produce some stuff for youtube so if i'm like doing a deep dive on the next generation military simulator technology like i'll use riverside to create that content uh, because it's the sheet screen sharing so good the ability to pull the high-res media off it's so good so like now has never been an, uh, an easier time to be a creator like here i am but this like full studio set up, right? I got a mix board down here. I got in your mics, but like this stuff off of Amazon with pennies on the dollar um, because a high quality mic is in this virtual world. So important these days, but as a you know, creator, you don't, as a creator, not everybody will spend the money on the nice microphones. Not everybody will spend the money on that stuff, but it just takes a little bit to get a little bit of professionalism. And then again, Kevin, as you mentioned this thing, like y- your competition is 1% of this entire mm-hmm. sum total of whatever social media, like, you're trying to get after whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, like 1% of that sum total of that population posts. There's a lot of people that are just like waiting for content that want and each of them have their own, money. each of them have their yeah. own niche. And so you're not even in competition with most of them. They're That's just it. fellow content creators and you're helping one another. Um, and we, we talk about it all the time with, with other podcasts guys, they'll, they'll ask me to be on theirs and I'll be on theirs and, you know, we'll, we'll essentially share each other's networks at that point. It becomes a collaborative environment instead of a zero sum world. So important, man. So important that collaborative environment. And like, there's only, we talked about it. I was, oh, I was going to be the Arctic warfare guy. I was going to be the whatever guy. Like I'm Mark Holden, right? There's only one Kevin. There's only one Greg. Like there are a lot of Navy SEALs and Green Berets out there, but there's only one Kevin, only one Greg. Right. And it's, it's about making sure you know you double down on yourself. And, and again, like, the, the power of the network is so powerful. It's like, you know, you don't get that in B2B business to business as much as you do when you're doing like EDE entrepreneur to entrepreneur, where you've got to eat what you kill, right? The EDE groups, those are the ones who really support themselves. There's so much less cutthroat down at this level than there was up at corporate America. Corporate America was getting a little bit too games of throny for me. It was a little bit too much governing <laughs> off of fear and like working with yeah. other entrepreneurs are awesome because they're so easy to do business with. They're really available and easy and like they just want they just work with people that they want to work with. So you're not going to get any like begrudged employee or anything like that. And I've loved working with small businesses and entrepreneurs because, again, especially veterans, because they just want to help them out. It's just such a perfect fit. This is easy. It's no longer work. I I show up. I talk to people, have some good conversations, provide good value and call it a day. Like that's that's what my day has become, which is far beyond what I thought it would ever be. Like when I was getting out of the military, I was like, well, I like the startup world because I think startups are kind of like the SEAL platoon, you know, small, sure. tight knit team, bunch of people wearing multiple hats um, and being unified on, on a single purpose. And I started like, well, you know, go into the operations side because that's just what military people do. We, we know operations, so we can do business operations. Not the same thing, not at all. Um, and so as I started interviewing, like, this is not what I wanted whatsoever. And so I had to open up my my aperture of what what's going to be the next chapter in my life. And so I, you know, it's, it's still looking for a job, trying to find a job, trying to find something that's going to fill the void of being a seal, being a service member for over a decade. Uh, it, the, the first step is just realizing that you're not going to fill that gap. That gap is 
is very unique and it's going to be its own thing. You need to understand that there's another chapter of your life that you're moving on to. And that's what entrepreneurship has given me is that I still feel purpose. It is an amazing purpose, but my purpose now is not shooting guns, blowing up doors and you know killing bad guys. It's helping other veterans find success in life, find purpose in life, find happiness through uh, ownership of their, their own careers. And it doesn't matter what that purpose is, as long as you resonate with that purpose. And now you can move forward with that. And life just gets so much better once you find that, that groove. Greg, what are your thoughts on that? Sorry, my, my, my microphone just, or not my microphone, but my speakers just came off. Um, yeah, no, that's, I think that that's like, that's been the, the a breath, a breath of fresh air is like, obviously getting to work with Kevin and this is all we do. Like, this is all I do now is I just like have conversations with cool people plus Kevin, who's cool sometimes. Yeah. And <laughs> then, you know, and we just, that's it, man. And, and I think like the, the cool thing about like, you know, the way that this is built out is as we grow, we'll be able to do less of the not so fun stuff and mm. focus more on like creating more value. So like when we get, if we get to a thousand members paying 20 bucks a month, like that's going to enable us to pay somebody to like produce this podcast and do all the back end stuff, which is just going to free us up to like build more relationships with like really cool people that can come on and host a web host a webinar or, you know, focus on building some sort of like in-person event. So that's, that's like, that's to me is like, what's so fun about, about all this. A couple of things there. One shameless plug. If you want to collaborate on an in-person event, I might be done yeah. with that. Um, I might, I, cause I've, I've, that's something I'm probably a couple of years out from, but I'd love to love to connect with you on that at some point question I've got for you guys, you know, if you're open to chatting with that, like, how's your spouse, your significant others, your partners, like how have they, how have they adopted, like adapted to this? Right. So they potentially were with you thinking you're going to be a W2 employee making some bank at some point, but now you're doing the scrappy entrepreneurial life. Not saying that that's not been lucrative, but it's a, just a different type of stability, right? Like how has your partners been, um, you know, supporting you through that? Like, how has that been? Why don't you kick it off, Kevin? Um, that's, that's tough. You know, it, it, it work, working with entrepreneurs, it, it's such a, an interesting space because you know, we, we want to help as many veterans as possible. Sure. Um, and so we didn't want to niche down and be like, all right, we're just going to work with content creators. Um, and so th there's such a, a wide breadth of, of industry out there. You know, we have, we have ghostwriters, we have guys that um, are, are in, they, they brew in their own beer or just selling their own alcohol there. There's um, one guy that has his own uh, archery targets. There's construction people, like there's, there's, there's software apps. We have a guy doing a, a mental health AI assessment that people can journal with it. It'll interact with them. Um, so there's, there's such a, a wide variety of people we're working with. Obviously, Greg and I can't be experts in all those spaces. It's just not possible. Nor would I ever claim to be an expert in those space. But what we can offer is a, uh, a wealth of resources. We can provide the, the, the foundational baseline knowledge of running a business. Like every business is going to have to go through these steps, you know, incorporating, setting up business bank accounts, getting a, uh, a fictitious business name. So you can have a, a DBA to open bank accounts, uh, federal tax ID numbers, all the little things that go into establishing a business. Then we can give them tips and tricks. Hey, this is why you pay yourself. This is why you go through payroll and, and you know, the, the tax incentives that you can have through, through running a business where a hundred thousand dollars revenue as a business owner is vastly or can be vastly more valuable than a hundred thousand dollars salary through a W two uh, yep. paycheck, and uh, giving giving these tools, these tricks, these uh, the, these resources to enable veterans to be successful entrepreneurs is is what we want this community to be. And if we can get as many veterans on a single platform with, where they're communicating with each other, kind of what we're talking about, like pulling the community, the, pulling the conversations off of LinkedIn onto and we're not claiming to be some secure platform with you know, ID me verification to make sure that you're a veteran. Like if you're going to say you're a veteran, we'll, we'll allow you on there. We just ask you to respect uh, people's privacy and um, not attribute any content on there. Um, but we want to have veterans being able to talk with veterans about things that are, that matter to them without just being blasted out to the broader world. So they feel that, that level of safety and security 
having conversations that might be tough. Like we get Greg and I get hit up all the time um, about mental health stuff. But guys was like, I was feeling crushed. I'm, e- even currently, guys are like, "Hey, man, I'm hitting that red line financially. I need help. I'm stressing mentally. The, the business is, is is struggling. What can I do? You know, putting out putting myself out there to the community. Um, does anybody want this service? Um, and so they're not asking for free handouts. They're not saying, "Hey, I need money." give me a loan. It's, would you be interested in, in working with my business? Can you put word out about my business? And it, so it turns into this collaborative pool of people all wanting to see everyone else successful. No one's competing with each other on this platform. They're all trying to to help each other out and, and provide services and information. True story. Mark, to answer your question, however, thanks, Greg. my wife, uh, I think Kevin was focused on <laughs> Kevin. You went off on a, a, a beautiful, beautiful rant about the veteran new clock. My apologies. <laughs> I, I, I get squirrel vision exactly, sometimes. Exactly what this world needed right now. He, he squirreled it because my headphones were giving feedback or my, not having headphones was giving feedback. Um, so he's telling me to shut the fuck up and turn off my mic. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my wife, you know, so I, I always talk about this because I think it's so important and about entrepreneurship is that you have to be in like the right financial space to be able to do that. And fortunately, like we are just because, you know, we've done well in real estate and we've done well um, saving our money and just being conscious of, of our financials. Um, but also my wife works full time. So um, me taking this leap is something that we can do financially. So it, it kind of makes sense to make the gamble. And um, especially right now where like we're, uprooting our family to the Netherlands. Like this is the perfect time to do it, to like dive in full into entrepreneurship um, and and give it a go because I'm not going to, I could find a job over here, um, but I don't want to be a W2 employee. And so that's why, you know, I'm focusing so hard on trying to build a future where I can just be an entrepreneur and do cool things like this. And my wife is completely on board with it. She's super cool with it. Uh, she, would she likes more predictability? Sure. Sure. But who wouldn't, you know, and that's kind of like, for me, that's like the exciting part about this is that it's not predictable and, you know, you never know what's, I don't know what tomorrow's going to look like, and, but I do know that I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. Like that's for, for the most part, you know, which is, which is like the nice thing, right? Yes. And there's nobody to tell you about TPS reports or PowerPoint presentations. Like you are the master and commander of your schedule and your time and your deliverables. And there's only Kevin there to waterboard you if things go wrong. So I get that. <laughs> well, it'll be a long waterboard. I'll have to fly all the way out there, track him down, thaw out the water. <laughs> it's frozen tundra out there. I wouldn't see it coming. So you'd have that. You'd have the element of surprise. There you go. This is true. Hey, so. you get a drone to do it. I'm sure we got waterboarding, a waterboarding drone. Okay. I love it. Full circle here. Let us not forget the third rule, though, of enhanced interrogation. It's not waterboarding <laughs> if you use diesel fuel. <laughs> <laughs> that we will not need to thaw out, sir. Uh, Touche. Well, yeah, fair enough. Well, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. Sorry about my my little tirade there. Um, <laughs> as I said, I, I I was hearing Greg's feedback. I'm like, I'm just going to shoot him a message real quick. I'm not listening to Mark. Greg hands the question off to me. I'm like, I don't even know what he, what he asked. So I'm just going to try and uh, spit all this and, and make it work. Just start talking. <laughs> nailed it. There, you nailed it. <laughs> Sometimes it's what you got to do on a podcast. You know, there, there, there are no mistakes. There's only uh, things you talk through. Heard. <laughs> but, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, Mark. Um, you have a wealth of information. We're super excited to see everything that's going to be coming out from Holden Enterprises of, of sorts. Uh, I know we've talked a, bit, a few things. Um, that you have going on. I know the central repository of all your information is going to be on LinkedIn, but if you want to put out any other handles, websites, information for people to, to find you so they can get your content regularly. Yep. I appreciate the opportunity to plug. So you can find me on LinkedIn every day. I'm generally posting between 7am and 8am mountain time, just about every single day. Um, that's where all my stuff, like you want to sign up for my newsletter, you want to sign up for, uh, you know, the Vanguard, like all my links are in there. All my link trees there. Um, no only fans there yet, but we're, we're working cool. on it. 
that. Um, we just you know, talked about that. getting a, a calendar for for Herb Thompson. So maybe maybe we'll get a Mark Holden calendar. Herb needs a Herb, Herb, Herb definitely. I can see a Herb calendar. I'm not sure people want a Mark Holden calendar, but <laughs> all that to say is like, yeah, find me on LinkedIn if you are interested and morbidly curious about my defense consultancy. It's defensebyholden.com, but also that link is on. Um, is on the the LinkedIn's uh, the www.thevanguardcommunity.com. We'll get you to our Vanguard landing page. There's a 10 minute kind of walkthrough video. I recommend if you're just like intellectually curious about Vanguard or what we're doing. There's like a 10 minute sales letter there. Just check it out, video style. If it interests you, there's a free month going on right now. We'd love the opportunity to get in. You can cancel it at any time. But I'm uh, if you again, you can sign up for my newsletter. My newsletter is slowly starting to come further and further online in my LinkedIn, but I am very excited because in the months to come, www.holdensends.com will be coming online as my next extension. And this one is probably the thing I'm most excited about of the, all the things that I've been you know, launching in the last nine months or so. It's something that probably will come online uh, in late March, early April, working with a lot of brands right now to stand up a lot of content for that. And I'm very excited about it. So yeah, today find me on LinkedIn, but in a few weeks, few months, www.holdensends.com will be your one-stop shop for all things Mark Holden. Um, but until we get there, find me on LinkedIn. I love the opportunity to connect with you. I'm pretty active in the comments section for the first hour. And if you're at any of the uh, uh, defense innovation yep. conferences, look for the guy with the perfectly manicured beard and the Mohawk. You'll yep. easily recognize him as as the uh, the voice of Holden, uh, reach out to him. He'll he'll give you business cards. He'll say what's up. He'll probably grab a beer with you or something. That's right. Yep. That's what that's what I got. And I appreciate the opportunity to play. I'd love to see you in person. So that's where to find me. And if you do see me running around at one of those trade shows, please say my name. I love it every time we get a chance to connect. Um, it's it's magical for me. So that's what I got, Kevin, Greg. I deeply appreciate the opportunity to connect with you guys. Are powerhouses and juggernauts of industry. So. Thanks for the opportunity to learn with you. I love the opportunity to do this again and can't wait to uh, listen to the next, whatever, 48 podcasts you guys have uh, scheduled this week. So appreciate it. And I'm around. Pushing through them. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Bye, brother. Appreciate you. Take care. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you.